that day I live in a dream Welcome to Only Trying to Help, the podcast where we try to help you be helpful to other people. I'm so excited about my guest today. I'm here with Christine, and I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Tell us about you, Christine. Well, hi, I'm Christine Allen. And um, well, I love to say that I'm a native New Yorker because um, I was born and raised here and um, New York City has been good to me. So I like to give it a plug. (laughs) And um, I'm a retiree from New York City service, worked for the city, gave my blood, sweat and tears for 38 years. And then it was time. Um, And and I'm a New York State licensed social worker. And so I work as a a family recovery therapist with um, outpatient program, um, helping families that are dealing with their loved ones who are addicted. Um, I'm also a self-published um, author. Um, I wrote a book about mm, 12 years ago, and then I revised it about three years ago um, called Stepping Out of It All, A Guide to Recovery from Everything. And I wrote this book because I am a person in recovery. And um, what it has helped me do is to recover in areas beyond addiction or drug addiction. It's helped me to recover personally, to guide my personal development. It's helped me with parenting. It's helped me with everything because it gave me a a framework. And so I wrote this book because um, I wanted to share that framework outside of the, you know, the realm of addiction, but just as, um, you know, people needing to recover from some of the stuff in their lives, you know, like uh, bad relationships or divorce or a low self-esteem or low self-worth or, you know, any of the things, negative self-image or body dysmorphia or whatever it is, you can recover from it. And as I found that to be the um, the game changer in my life. I wrote the book so that I could help other people to change the game for themselves. Um, um, I'm a mother of one and a grandmother of one, and um, um, I'm divorced. And um, and I've learned to be grateful and happy for all of it, you know, for every single thing that has happened. Um, in my younger years, I used to say, oh, God, why has this happened to me? But I realized that every single thing that has happened in my life is now a part of the fabric of who I am today. So I wouldn't change a thing because I'm I'm pretty good with who I am. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I uh, I. I'm I'm listening to you talk about what sounds like multiple careers that you've had and lots of life experience and motherhood and all the things. And I'm reflecting on the five years that we've been doing this podcast and, and all of the, the helpers who have been listening. And I'm thinking, gosh, I wish I knew you five years ago, Christine, because I'm starting to get the sense that you're like a master helper and perhaps Perhaps our audience needed you a long time ago, especially as I hold your book in my hands right now. And I just love the title, Stepping Out of It All, A Guide to Recovery from Everything. And and that word everything is hitting me because on this show, yeah, okay, we, we theme our episodes. We might do one about like, helping somebody through divorce. And then another one is helping somebody through recovery from addiction. And then another one is helping someone who has a health problem. But I love that what you've done is you have found the similarities, the the commonalities and all of these things. And you've said like, here's a way to get ourselves through just about anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I have a, if I could, I have a quick piece I'd like to read. Yeah. Um, from the book, um, I am a survivor. I am a survivor of a functioning, dysfunctional, alcoholic household of overrated middle classism, of reciprocal marital domestic violence, 
of unexpected infidelity, of excessive drinking, uncontrolled drugging, and long-term chain smoking, of unconsciously eating all of my feelings, of not having enough, of feeling like I was not enough, of overachieving for all the wrong reasons, of looking for love in all the wrong places, of a broken marriage, of a broken heart, of abandonment by all of the men in my life, of the need to be loved way too much, of no self-worth and damaged self-esteem, of lack of confidence, of a flawed self-image, of a broken, fractured personality, of needing validation, of unrelenting loneliness, of a tattoo-infused midlife crisis, of a multitude of spiritual and emotional disorders. I am a survivor of so many things that have periodically overwhelmed me throughout the years, some that have troubled me for all of my life. But the point is, I am a survivor. I am a survivor recovering from decades of living uncomfortably with myself. I've always been uncomfortable being in my own skin while trying to be comfortable with everyone else. I'm recovering from a number of isms, schisms, ideologies and views from unfounded ideas, beliefs and attitudes, distressing obsessions, irrational thinking, unhealthy behaviors. I'm recovering from a lot of things, a duffel bag full of life concerns. What's most important to say is that I am recovering from myself. Mm -hmm. I'm a recovering woman recovering from an inability to deal with the truth. I'm recovering from fantasy, from grandiosity, from failures, from fear of failure, from self-centered fear, from low self-worth, from people pleasing to prove my worth, from lying to myself and lying to others, from illusion and delusion, from an inability to confront, from running away, from not standing up, from moving too fast, from moving too slow, from just being stuck with no idea how to move and nowhere to go. I'm recovering recovering from myriad emotions, from feelings, hurt feelings, from unresolved anger and long-term resentments, from ongoing frustrations, from disheartening disillusionment. I'm recovering from love, from not getting enough and not getting what I need, from giving too much, from heartache and heartbreak, from pain, emotional, physical, mental, spiritual, from self-indulgent based in pain, from too much of a bunch of stuff used to mask the pain, from self-neglect, from negative self-perception, from skewed perceptions of others, from very distorted thinking, from being trapped inside my own thinking, stuck inside my own mind, confined by my own self-imposed prison, struggling and grappling to get myself out, unfree. I am recovering from all of that. I'm learning how to navigate and survive my emotions and I'm working to change outdated approaches that I've used to manage life as it presents. So my mission and purpose is to share with others how they can use the concept of recovery to get better. My goal is to support others in their personal process of getting comfortable with themselves, to become more comfortable with others, and ultimately to be more comfortable dealing with life. I want to share the viable valuable truths that I discovered, the greatest of which is it is possible to recover. It is possible to recover from anything, from everything. Ooh. Oh my goodness. Well, I can uh, guarantee you I'll be reading that again later when, when we're done re recording, but thank you for sharing that. I, I think the question I have to ask you is what does it do for you to be able to put that out there for others to consume? Well, um, so initially when I wrote this book, I wrote it under a pseudonym because I was working for the government. And I said, if they find out that 20 years ago I had a drug problem because I was in my 20s and my 30s, they'll put me out immediately. So I wrote it under a pseudonym because I, there was still some shame attached with what had happened. And as I've grown in my recovery, I realized that I can't let my shame stop me from sharing my experience, strength and hope because it helped me when other people shared theirs, when they got vulnerable and they told their truth, it gave me permission to tell my truth. And so um, I realized um, just in the recovery experience, but also in the work that I do um, with families that are dealing with addiction, that I have a responsibility 
you know, I have an obligation to tell the truth. So what it does for me is um, you said that I'm a, a I'm a I'm a helper. I try to look for opportunities to help, you know, whether it is through personal development or professional, you know, uh, help when people are trying to move in their careers, et cetera, et cetera. I've been all of that in my life, you know, work with the government, whether it was social services or teaching school, you know, or working with seniors or, you know, working with HIV AIDS in New York City or, you know, like all of the work has been um, designed to help. And I didn't realize until, you know, in, in, in reflecting that I'm like, well, look, look, look at God, how he has had me on a path. And I was just stumbling through my life, just kind of staying alive and then staying alive and staying clean. And I realized that he was positioning me to help mm -hmm. some more in different mm -hmm. ways. So it, it helps me to know that, even if I don't know what my specific purpose is, I know that part of it is to help others. Yeah. So, yeah. In so many ways, you embody a lot of what we talk about on the show because, um, you know, people tune in because they think of themselves as like, I'm a helpful person and I want to help other people and I want to do it really well. Great. We're glad you're here, helpers. But a lot of them tune in because they know deep down they're struggling with like, how do I say the right things? How do I do the right things? I don't want to be overbearing. I don't, I don't know how to be there for my loved ones. And what we consistently say over and over and over again is you cannot make your loved ones do anything they don't want to do. You cannot force them to change their lives. You cannot make their anxiety go away. You cannot make their depression go away. You cannot make their addiction go away. And if you really want to help people, you might have to look inward and change yourself. And what you read to us, Christine, is just like the epitome of everything we've been talking about, which is if you want to help other people start with you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, one, one of the things that um, I was fearful about, but I am no longer, um, is that people would judge me because I had gotten involved with drugs, right? But look, I'm 17 and, and they're, they're doing what they're doing and I want to be a part of the crowd. So I do what they do, you know, and I have no idea, you know, about addiction or any of that. And, um, you know, and life keeps happening and, and, and it keeps progressing and the times change and we're going from this drug to that drug to that club to that club, you know, and, and then I'm caught up and I don't know how to get out of that. And the, the shame and the guilt and the remorse that I felt for years after I'd stopped using, it kept me quiet, not amongst the community, the recovery community, but with everyone else. I kept it quiet because I didn't want to tell. And then um, when Whitney Houston died, I felt guilty because I hadn't finished writing my book. And I felt like if I had written this, this may have given her permission, you know, to say, I'm not alone. I, I don't have to be shameful and I could seek help. Right. And, um, you know, that might sound grandiose, you know, that my little book could help Whitney, but I I've seen, you know, stranger things happen. Um, and then as people started coming out and speaking about their truth, especially during this opioid crisis, I felt like, you know, like I, I started out saying I'm a woman in recovery, you know, and um, I would have never said that because of the shame. But what I'm focused on now is the grace and the victory that I've experienced by finding something to get out of that dark place. And I feel like, you know, anybody that's in the dark place, I need to be able to say, hey, you could get out of there. And if you want some help, I'm here. If people like me that are here, you know, um, but I'm not ashamed to say I'm a recovering addict. It's okay. You know, and if you judge that, that's okay. But I'm a survivor, you know, so. 
I don't know, life keeps happening and you get older and a little more mature and you stop caring about what are, what other people think about who you are and how you are. And you just learn to, you know, people say, I want to be authentic. Well, you can't be authentic until you figure out who you are. And so it takes some work figuring out who you are. But once you do, the level of freedom of being able to speak out about who you are or what you think or, you know, what you want to do or how you can help other people to do what they want to do. It just becomes easier, you know? So, yeah. Christina, I think you've done a, a huge service of reducing that shame and stigma by finding those commonalities among many different kinds of addictions and, and the many kinds of things that people may need to recover from People get addicted and hooked on and and numb out and check out with a lot of things. And it can be shopping or gambling or sex or food or people pleasing or work or all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I guess I just want to say to folks, like before you try fixing other people in your life, what are you addicted to? What are you using to numb yourself? What are you using to not really feel the pain of life. You know, for a lot of people, it's scrolling through social media mindlessly. They're not even participating. They're not even liking or commenting. They're just scrolling forever. And for a lot of people, it's Netflix. It's like another episode, another episode, another episode. Folks, we all kind of have things we do that help us detach from what's really hurting us in life. And before you point the finger at so-and-so who's using drugs and alcohol, look at yourself. Yeah, it really is. You know, when I think about um, the the work that I do and the conversations that I have, it's really just the human condition, you know. Uh, and like you said, you know, you get attached to something that helps you to, you know, kind of become oblivious to what's going on in your life because you're not really happy with what's going on with your life. And it might start out socially, but I know people who started out socially drinking just so they could connect with other people, but didn't realize that social drinking could lead to, you know, being at home, you know, drinking yourself into a deeper oblivion. So it's just the human condition. It is not feeling good about self, not being comfortable with self, you know, not liking who you are, dealing with childhood trauma, you know, dealing with something that happened. That's one of the questions that I ask in my work. Well, what happened? You know, and often they're like, no, I'm good. I'm good until we keep talking. And then they say, well, this did happen when I was 13. And I say, ah, because it is just a human experience that whatever it is that you go through, that you try to find a way to go through it, you know, without hurting as much. And that can lead you to, you know, some good things because I was an overachiever in school because I didn't feel like I was enough. I felt a sense of inadequacy. And so I worked so hard to prove that I was enough. So I was an A student. I was an honor student. You know, I, you know, did well in school, did well on jobs. But the the underlying thing that was going on was not good because I'm trying to prove that I'm good enough because I feel so inadequate. And so the deal was to figure out what it was that made me feel the way that I felt so I could address that, you know, and instead of putting a Band-Aid on my, you know, my cut that really is from internal bleeding, you know, the Band-Aid is not helping me. Let me deal with the thing on the inside that's really causing the uproar in my life. And so, you know, finding that out through recovery, through the recovery process, you know, being able to look in and figure out who you are and how you tick. And 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 if you want to do better, how do you move from point A to point B and get better, you know, is um is the piece that I've found has been life-changing. Yeah. And yeah, I just want to share that. Well, I'm glad that you have, and I'm glad that the book is available for folks who want to read more about that. I think we would be probably failing our audience if we didn't, before we wrap up here, talk a little bit about this idea of codependency, because you and I chatted like a month ago and said, oh, this would be a great podcast episode. And yet we haven't really gotten to it. Can you help 
you know, I, I think you should know our audience may include some therapists, but not necessarily. There are a lot of people tuning in who who have heard the word codependent. They hear it thrown around a lot, but they don't really know what that means. Could you help us a little bit? Sure. So when I started doing this work, I said I work as a family recovery therapist and I'm very um, clear about that. I don't want to do, you know, straight family therapy. I want to work with family recovery because we deal with outpatient. The clients are getting their help and the families are usually left to the side, but they're usually so consumed with their codependent behavior. I got to save my kid or my husband. And so I started doing the work as a family recovery therapist. And the primary um, uh, topic that I work on is codependency and all the things that come out of that. So a codependent person is one who lets another person's behavior affect him or her and who is obsessed with controlling that person's behavior. So I want to fix you. I want to manage things. I want to stop you. I want to help you. Let me take the car keys. Let me, you know, pour the alcohol down the drain. Let me stand in front of the door. You know, let me just help you to change your life. And the reality is codependent people are so consumed with these codependent behavior behaviors, you know, with caretaking, you know, and, and making sure, enabling you know, those are the those are the buzzwords that are out there. But what has happened is they are so consumed with their loved one that they lose themselves, you know, in the process and they find themselves running around town trying to find their loved one, trying to control their behavior. And they cannot. So codependency is a is an interdependency or dependency on another person trying to fix them. And uh, uh, they talk about codependency as a part of addiction because it is. They call it relationship addiction or they call it love addiction, but it's all addiction. It is all based uh, uh, in obsession and compulsion and self-centeredness and all of the behaviors that are developed as a result of um, me needing to fix you usually comes out of something that's missing in me. You know, um, I used uh, Codependent No More as the basic text for my work with families because I find that if we can look at your behaviors, usually it's something that came from, you know, your childhood when you were 12 or what you saw or what your family did or how they communicated. And so you just took your show on the road, married somebody and recreated that same thing in a new household. And so it is looking at where did this originate? What are the behaviors and how can we um Look at each behavior, where it came from, you know, what's underneath it, the feelings that are underneath it. And is it valid or legitimate for your current living? Or is it something that you learned to do when you were 12 and now you continue to do it at 52? Yeah. And so, you know, our work is looking at how do we um, tear apart the codependent behavior by looking at the specific behaviors that come out of it and um, and give the person a chance through their own self-determination that that is no longer legitimate or valid. And, and, and what has happened is people are learning how to communicate differently, how to um, deal in their relationships and their family dynamics differently, how to create boundaries, you know, and boundaries are not, I'm going to create a fence around you. Boundaries are, I'm going to create a fence around me so that I can protect me really from me, but for, for, for the purpose of the audience from you. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, I, I think this, again, like this whole show was created for people who like to think of themselves as I'm a helper, but like almost by definition, that puts this audience at pretty big risk of developing this codependency thing. And I want the audience to really think about what Christine said, that as you're trying to help other people who may have their own problems, you can get a kind of addiction to that 
where now you're hooked on helping people or quote unquote, saving people or rescuing people. And you may not realize how you yourself have a bit of a, a an addiction or a dependency to that. And the, the, the part of it that I think gets really messed up, Christine, and I'm sure you see this a lot, is when the person who thinks of themselves as like, I'm the healthy one, right? And I'm, I'm the healthy one here to fix everybody else. They start to rely on everyone else to have problems. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, like, so the really messed up part is they, on some level, don't even want everybody to get better because then who would I help? If you, mm-hmm. if my friends and family members weren't such needy screw ups, I would have no one to help. So I kind of need that. Because it, it it allows me to fulfill my purpose of being the healthy one who who rescues everybody all the time. And this is where it gets really, really complicated. I see you nodding and smiling like you are dying to say something. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of the time, like you said, the people that come to see me, they are the family members who are like, my son is sick or my husband is sick or my wife is sick and I need you to help me to fix her. So I say, so I can't help you fix her because really she's not broken. And there are some, the other people over there will help her. You know, the psychiatrists, the counselors, the all of those people over there, they'll help her. I'm here to help you. So let's look at you. And they're like, look at me. There's nothing wrong with me. But when we start to pull apart the behaviors, we see that there is enabling and caretaking and lack of self-care and low self-worth. You know, their loved one is talking to them crazy and, you know, and, and, and doing all kinds of behaviors. And they're doing everything that they can, mortgaging their homes or, you know, getting loans so that they can pay for bail again and again or pay for treatment again and again. And there's something wrong with that picture, because at some point. It's important that you step back and move out of the fantasy of what you're actually doing and into the reality of what's really happening. And though I love you, I can't save you. And what I need to do, you know, the old adage, you know, what happens when the plane is going down and the oxygen mask comes out? Who do you give the air to, to your kid or to yourself? And most people say to their kid, no, because then your kid will be standing there and you'll pass out. You take the oxygen first, because once you take care of yourself, then you can help the people that are around you. But going to places like Al-Anon and Naranon and Family Anonymous and Celebrate Recovery and those support groups that can actually help families with their codependency and and, and with their own self-care, I think are, are, are really, really critical in the process because everybody needs help. And you need to find your tribe or your people where you can get the help. You know, so whether you need to go to Al-Anon or Naranon or you need to go to uh, 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 Overeaters Anonymous or Sex Anonymous or Gamblers Anonymous, I don't care. Go to any A (laughs) because every A has the same format that is dealing with the same things. Let's look at you. You know, let's get you into a place where you can be honest about that so that you can repair yourself in order to repair your relationships so that then you can help people in a healthy way. So I don't know if that answered the question. I think I might have gone off on a tangent a little bit. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I will just say, you know, I recently spoke to someone who said to me, she's in recovery. And I said, recovery from what? And she smiled. She said, I'm glad you asked. She said, people usually assume it's drugs and alcohol. And she said, I'm in, I'm a recovering codependent person. Mm -hmm. Um, She said, I'm recovering from being codependent. And we had a great talk about that. But the gist that I want to share with the audience is that this was a person who was recovering from helping people in recovery. (laughs) I mean, it's, it's fascinating how you can get a bit addicted to being the helper so much that you need everyone else to have problems. Um, And I would just say, you know, folks, take a look around your friend circles and your family. Like if you mostly spend time with all the people who you perceive to have major problems in their lives, is it doing something for you? Like, is, is that serving a purpose for you? 
to seek out people who seem to need you in some way. And I don't know, I'm not diagnosing here. I'm just, you know, saying it's worth exploring. What is the purpose of that? How is it serving serving you or is it serving you? Um, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't mention CODA, which is Codependence Anonymous for code, Codependence. Yeah. So if you're a codependent, there's a meeting for you too, specifically. Uh, and, and I think that's so healthy to be able to say to yourself, okay, I'm helping, but why am I helping? Am I helping because I feel out of control? Um, am I helping because I couldn't help my father with his drinking? And so now I'm trying to help every person that I can so they don't die. You know, or what? It, there's always something underneath you know, um, friends and friends of mine, most of the people that I know are clinical <laughs> and we always laugh. We say, oh, my God, everybody I know is social workers and they all got problems. Yeah, because usually social workers find, you know, some solace or resolve and then they want to go about helping other people to find solace and resolve, you know. So but it's OK if there's some some brokenness, it's OK. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, the journey continues. It gives you an opportunity to just keep on taking a look and taking another look to be the best you that you can be. Yeah. 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 Always kind of peeling back the layers to know yourself better. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I was going to say this has been fun. And, and when I say that, I laugh because I'm sure there are people out there who think these conversations are not fun, but to me, they are. Uh, I had great fun. I know we have barely scratched the surface of all of these topics that are in your book, this idea of codependency. I will be for sure begging you to come back on so we can do part two of this. But is there anything for now that you feel like, oh, I really wanted to say this or share this that I didn't get the chance to share? This would be a good time if there's something on your mind that you would really like to impart on the audience? Well, I'll just say, um, as the new year comes in, it's an opportunity to reflect, you know, to look at your year and things that have happened, but it's also an opportunity to look at yourself and where you're at and to practice this word and all the master's programs that I've taken. They did not say this word, but I learned it. Self-honesty. To practice self-honesty. Where are you at? How do you feel about where you're at? And what do you want to do about it? You know, um, uh, uh, they talk about the three A's in Al-Anon, and it's something that I say with my families all the time. If you want to create some change in your life, there's the, the secret recipe, you know, of awareness, becoming aware of what is going on, of acceptance, accepting what it is that's going on, and action. What are you willing to do? What are you going to do in order to change it? You know, so um, as the new year comes in, just take a look at where you are, you know, and maybe include that in some of your resolutions or goal setting, you know, that you if you want to do something different, then you got to do something different and just decide what is it that you want to do? As I like to say, what do you want to be when you grow up, young lady? <laughs> I say that to myself. Um, so yeah, it's a chance. It's a it's an opportunity to you know to to be your best self. You know, at least to try to be better today than you were yesterday, and tomorrow try to be a little better tomorrow than you were today. You know? So thank you so much. It's been an honor, you know, and it's really been a pleasure. Um, I could talk all day long you know, about helping and about recovery and about uh, codependency and about addiction. Um, so it would be a pleasure to come back and talk some more. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And we will definitely have you back on.